In this talk, I'll discuss coagulase-negative staphylococcal infections. I want to first review the microbiology of coagulase-negative staphylococci to describe a little bit about the epidemiology and clinical manifestations of these infections. And I want you to recognize the challenge of differentiating true coagulase-negative staphylococcal bacteremia from contamination, a common clinical scenario, often in association with IV catheters, as are pictured here on the slide. So imagine you're covering the inpatient pulmonary service. It could be any service uh, at night. And at 3 a.m., these are always at 3 a.m., aren't they? The microbiology lab calls you to report that of the two blood cultures that were collected from Mr. X yesterday, one has turned positive. And as the technologist will do, uh, they have done a gram stain, and that shows gram-positive cocci and clusters. So what do you do? Well, there's no simple answer, and that's part of what I want to go through. The clinical context in this case matters. Recall that when you have a gram stain that shows gram-positive cocci, the next thing the lab will do is perform the catalase test, which will differentiate staphylococci from streptococcus. And then if they have identified staphylococci, we'll do a coagulase test to differentiate staph aureus from the coagulase-negative staphylococci. So they're gram-positive cocci and clusters, catalase-positive and coagulase-negative. A picture of the coagulase test appears on this slide. Now, in practice, coagulase-negative staphylococci can be further speciated. There are a number of different uh, species that cause human infections, such as staph epidermidis or staph hominis, staph capitis. But in clinical practice, the labs often will not differentiate these, and this is because they cause a similar spectrum of illness, so it may not be necessary to know exactly which species you're dealing with, as long as you know this is a coagulase-negative staph infection and you know a little bit about the antimicrobial susceptibility profile, it may not be relevant to know exactly what species you're dealing with. So the lab may opt not to invest the time and the effort into figuring out exactly what species you're talking about. There is an exception to this. There's one species of coagulase-negative staphylococci called staphylogdenensis that tends to cause more virulent uh, disease, more akin to staph aureus, uh, and would be treated like staph aureus. So here in our lab, if the if they identify a coagulase-negative staphylococcus uh, isolate, they'll do some further testing and ensure that it's not staphylogdenensis. Uh, and if not, they'll just report it as coagulase-negative staphylococci without doing further speciation. Coag-negative staph are truly ubiquitous colonizers of skin. They're natural skin flora, roughly 100% prevalence. Maybe there's somebody somewhere in the world who doesn't have coag-negative staph on their skin, uh, but I think it's probably 100%. And like staph aureus, uh, negative staph are transmitted by direct contact. They tend to be less virulent than staph aureus and typically cause infections that are related to prosthetic material. So you won't see negative staph in uh, uncomplicated skin abscesses, for example, as you would with staph aureus. Instead, you'll see these infections in association with intravenous catheters, with cardiac devices and prosthetic valves in association with orthopedic hardware or vascular grafts. The concept here is that where there is plastic or metal or prosthetic material in your patient, coagulase-negative staph may latch on and subsequently cause infection. But the real challenge with coag-negative staph is that precisely because they're ubiquitous skin flora, they're also the most frequent contaminant in blood cultures. So if good sterile technique is not followed, it's possible to contaminate a blood culture bottle with skin flora, with coag-negative staph that wasn't actually in the bloodstream but shows up in a blood culture specimen because of the contamination. So depending on how good your phlebotomists are or how good you are, uh, it may be that a blood culture that grows coag-negative staph is more likely to represent a contaminant than true infection. However, coag-negative staph does cause real disease and antibiotic resistance can complicate the therapy. So you can't uh, automatically ignore coag-negative staph from a blood culture. Instead, you have to think through that scenario. So here's the challenge. You, when you get that 3 a.m. call from the microbiology lab, you have to think about whether that's more likely to be a real, a true coag-negative staph bacteremia or more likely to be a contaminant. You can think through a couple of factors in your mind. If, if the patient has risk factors such as prosthetic material or if the patient is immunosuppressed, whether that's HIV or on steroids uh, or has a malignancy, if the patient doesn't have a normal immune system, they may be more likely to get true infection with uh, coag-negative staph. 
Additionally, think about the number of cultures that are positive. A single positive culture may be more likely to represent a contaminant, whereas if you have multiple cultures from the same patient growing coag-negative staph, that's a clue that that probably really is there in the bloodstream as a real infection. And then importantly, does the patient have signs or symptoms of infection? So if a patient is clinically well, it may be less likely that there's a real infection there, whereas the patient uh, who is febrile uh, and not doing well, not feeling well, would be more likely to have a real coag-negative staph bacteremia. If you have established that your patient has a real coag-negative staph infection that merits treatment, then usually you would start with vancomycin. Coag-negative staph are frequently resistant to methicillin more than 80% of the time, usually due to having the MEK-A gene conferring methicillin resistance. So vancomycin is the agent of choice for empiric coverage. So when the microbiology lab calls you and says, this patient has gram-positive coxi and clusters in their blood, at that point you may not know if this is a staph aureus infection or is this a coag-negative staph infection. And you don't know the antibiotic susceptibility profile of that isolate. You don't want to wait for all of that to initiate therapy. That may be two or three days uh, later before you know that information. So you pick something for what's called empiric coverage. And for staph infections, that should usually be vancomycin while you're awaiting those other results. If it turns out that you have a methicillin-resistant coagulase-negative staph infection, then you would continue that patient on vancomycin for the duration of therapy. Whereas if you had a methicillin-susceptible isolate, similar to the scenario with MSSA, methicillin-susceptible staph aureus, then you would switch that patient to nafcillin or oxacillin. And whenever possible, you would want to remove infected prosthetic material when there's a coag-negative staph infection. It's not quite as mandatory or absolute as the scenario with staph aureus. There are some uh, catheter-related infections, for example, that can be successfully treated with retention of the catheter. But as a general concept, infected prosthetic material should be removed, including when infected with coag-negative staph. So for the scenario that I opened this slide set with, you get the call, you go evaluate this patient. That's a key thing here. You can't make this decision uh, remotely. You go and see the patient who has the positive blood culture. You notice that he has erythema and tenderness. That's redness and tenderness around one of his peripheral IV catheter sites. He's in the hospital. He has an IV, and it looks like he's gotten an infection or, uh, at that IV. So you remove the catheter and start vancomycin therapy while you're waiting further information from the micro lab. Ultimately, both of the blood cultures grow methicillin-resistant coag-negative staph. So at the time that you went and evaluated him, you only had one positive culture, but maybe six hours later or 12 hours later, the second one turns positive as well. Once you've removed the infected catheter and started vancomycin, follow-up cultures are drawn to ensure that the patient has cleared the bacteremia, and these are negative. There are no bacteria isolated. The patient completes the course of therapy and does well. You have worked through this coag-negative staph scenario effectively.